Good afternoon and a warm welcome to the 16th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2020 on this very dreary summer's day. Um, agenda item one for us today is to decide whether to take item three in private to allow discussion of today's evidence. Are the committee members content to take this in private? Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you very much. Um, agenda item two is a substantive bit of business today, which is a session on the impact of coronavirus outbreak on schools education and early learning. And I welcome to committee today John Swinney, MSP, Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills, and Councillor Stephen McCabe, Children and Young People Spokesperson at COSLA. And I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement on behalf of the Education Recovery Group. Thank you, Kavir. On Thursday of last week, I made a detailed statement to Parliament in which I outlined the progress we have made towards fully reopening schools in August and set out how we are working with partners to address the wider impacts of the virus on the health and well-being, educational progress and attainment of our children and young people. It is both a moral and educational imperative to support our children and young people back into school as soon as we know it is safe to do so. The Education Recovery Group, which I chair with Councillor McCabe, draws together the Scottish Government with our partners in local government, professional associations, education advisors and representatives of parents to prepare our education system to recover from the disruption of COVID. As part of this work, the group has received scientific advice in the COVID-19 Advisory Subgroup on Education and Children's Issues. The Education Recovery Group has taken this advice into consideration and last Friday finalised guidance provide for the safe reopening of both primary and secondary schools on a full-time basis for all pupils. The guidance clearly sets out the approach that must be taken, including a number of specific risk mitigation measures that will need to be taken forward in all educational settings to provide a safe environment for staff and pupils. A final decision on the reopening of schools will be taken by the Scottish Government's Cabinet on Wednesday and set out to Parliament by the First Minister on Thursday as part of our statutory three-weekly review process. This decision will be based on the prevalence of COVID within our community and whether that is at a sufficiently low level to enable a decision of this type to be taken. A decision to reopen schools is more likely to be given the development, given the development of the guidance that has taken place. Throughout this crisis, an important focus has been on supporting those children and young people who rely on schools, early learning and childcare, those individuals for whom these places offer, offer a safety and stability that they would otherwise be lacking. That is why learning hubs for vulnerable children and key workers have remained open over the summer, and meeting the learning needs of pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds continues to be a priority as we plan for the safe reopening of schools. It is also why I would like to reiterate my commitment to take stock of the impact of COVID-19 on equity and to closing the attainment gap. Our shared vision for education in Scotland remains to achieve excellence and equity for all children. I know that our partners in local government are as committed as we are to have our children back at school, having witnessed at close hand the endeavours of colleagues across the sector in recent months. I am confident that if we work, continue to work together, we will be in the very best position to support our children and young people to return safely to education and to achieve this aim. And I look forward to discussing these issues with the committee this afternoon. Thank you very much, Mr Swinney. And we will now move to questions. And I would like to invite Beatrice Wishart. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good afternoon, Cabinet Secretary, Councillor McCabe. The guidance on what happens with testing and um, any positive cases in schools is still vague and it's adding to anxiety in school communities. If, for example, one of the Scottish Government's tracers tells a pupil to isolate at home, it's still not exactly clear what the re repercussions would be for their school. I've pointed before to protocols that exist in New Zealand, where a school, if a school or early learning service there has a confirmed or probable case of COVID-19, they must close for 72 hours to allow contact tracing and then potentially for a further 14 days. Why is it not possible to have a similar national clarity in Scotland? Mr Swinney? Kavira, the, um, I think the answer to this question has to be set within the general context of what I think is 
being becoming increasingly obvious, and that is the very effective test and protect approach that we have in Scotland. We've seen in a couple of examples very um, vividly in Dumfries and Galloway, and then more recently in Lanarkshire, that where individual cases are identified, the test and protect arrangements come into play on every positive case. And there is contact tracing undertaken, and individuals who are required to isolate uh, have to do so. And what we have seen in these examples uh, is very clear evidence that the tracing system is working effectively to follow up the contacts that um, have arisen in these cases. And that would be no different to an educational setting as it is to any other setting within our society. But our guidance makes clear that if there is um, if there are two confirmed positive cases in a school within a 14-day period, then that would be defined as there being a, a, an incident within that particular school, and there would be a necessity for the school to contact the health protection uh, teams that are available in all uh, localities around the country. But I, I would doubt that that contact would actually be required because of the intense scrutiny that is being applied to every positive case that is taking place, which is nothing exceptional about education, but is the intense focus that is being undertaken on every single case that is advised. So I would reassure Beatrice Wishart that on a daily basis, when the information arises that there are positive cases, there is information sought um, by our health protection teams around the country around those cases around their connections to identify if there is any possible clustering of activity. And that has been at the core of the response most recently in the case that is taking place in Lanarkshire. Ms. Wishart? I, ha I have one more question, if I may, on, on uh, the time to implement change. Um, new guidance is to be issued again you know, later this week, and teachers then have two in-service days before they will be welcoming children back to the classroom. The expectation is that they will be ready with a flexible system, unlike anything that has been worked with before. And having seen the speed with which big decisions are being made and enforced um, following the incidents in Spain over the weekend, teachers and school staff may have to respond really quickly to new developments. So, would you acknowledge the extra burden that this will create for teachers and school, school staff? I, I acknowledge that these are challenging times, Convener, for everybody in our society and they will be no different to, to schools. I, I you know I freely um I concede and it's not even a concession, I'm happy to, to, to say that uh, I have uh, some anxiety about the reopening of schools because of the degree of change this represents in the uh, in the arrangements that we have within our society. You know, we've been in a, a, a situation for four months of you know really very limited contact between individuals and very limited gatherings and the opening of schools will be a very significant next step in the move out of lockdown so i readily acknowledge the uh, significance of the point that beatrice wisher makes um, and acknowledge the importance of ensuring that we have good clear advice and guidance that's available to school staff at the length and breadth of the country, and I'm confident that what the Education Recovery Group has worked on it will be able to deliver that advice to members of the teaching profession and other school staff around the country. Thank you. Can I invite Mr. Greer to ask? Thank you, Convener. Blended learning was premised on a reduced number of pupils in schools being the inevitable consequence of the need for social distancing. Now, distancing was provisionally dropped at the end of June, but it now appears to be back for high schools, while simultaneously telling them not to reduce capacity. So, could I ask, how are schools expected to distance pupils when classrooms and buildings are no bigger than they were in March? Is that Mr. Swinney, Mr. Councillor McCabe? Would Mr. Swinney, do you want to answer that one? I, I, I'll, I'll answer first. Essentially, what the um, the advice that is set out uh, and it's based on the 
scientific advice that we have taken is that young people are um, at the evidence demonstrates at low risk and um, a, a very limited evidence of prevalence in the transmission of COVID. But uh, the evidence is uh, less equivocal on that point the older we, we move through young people. So what the uh, guidance that um, has been uh, put together does is recognise that fact but encourages schools to do what can be done to maintain approaches to physical distancing between pupils and gives examples of how that should be undertaken through, for example, um, the circulation of young people within schools, through the spacing of areas within classrooms, through the uh, variation in class sizes to perhaps level out different um, groupings within individual subjects to ensure that there is not a concentration of pupils in one particular area. So the guidance goes into some a considerable range of options about how that can be undertaken through the use of space within schools and through the encouragement of young people to be physically distanced in the process. And by that measure, we can engage young people in the learning process and enable them to be able to reconnect with, uh, with their education as a consequence of the strategic decisions that have been made. Councillor McCabe, do you wish to add anything to that? Yeah, other than just to say that there will be limited opportunities to, to social distance in secondary schools, where, for example, the capacity of the school is, is very high. Um, I think Mr Swinney has obviously given some examples which are in the guidance, but they, they will not be a, applicable in, in all circumstances. So I think the reality is that um, there will be limited opportunities for social distance in, in secondary schools. Mr Green? Sorry, thanks. Mr Greer, you want to come back in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks, Camilla. Just one more um, question, uh, again, on the guidance on, on masks this time. The guidance for masks seems to be a bit out of line with the purpose of them. We, we wear masks to protect each other, not ourselves. Uh, but the guidance is that anyone who wants to wear one should be allowed to. But they're only effective if almost all of us are wearing them to protect each other. So, can I ask if, if masks are required in shops and on buses and trains by anyone over the age of five, why not in high schools in particular? And on what basis was it decided that distancing was worth recommending for high schools, but mask wearing was not? Mr. Swinney? On the, on the question of face coverings, I think there's a couple of important points. First of all, um, in a situation where members of staff are present within classrooms, um, they are encouraged to maintain physical distancing from pupils. But where that is not possible to be undertaken, the guidance supports some form of uh, face covering to be worn by members of staff. The guidance also makes clear that um, in, the, in any circumstances, any individual that wishes to wear a face covering should be able to do so uh, as, uh, you know, uh, as part of the general societal efforts to provide that protection. The, the judgment that was arrived at in the guidance was essentially predicated on the fact that in a, a school environment for a sustained period of time, um, over a long period of time, the wearing of face coverings um, might not be conducive to a satisfactory educational experience for uh, young people that would be involved uh, over such a protracted period of time. Um, now, obviously, we have to be, I think, willing, as part of the process of reopening schools, to revisit particular issues that emerge if we think that there is a need to take um, further action, but if we think that there is a necessity to move on some of these questions, we should be open to doing so. Um, the Education Recovery Group has developed guidance based on the best information that is available. But as colleagues will know, there is a, a, a rapidly expanding information base on COVID, which may well require us to do 
different things at different times. And we should be open to the consideration of these issues um, uh, as our experience of reopening schools takes its course. Councillor McCabe, do you wish to come in? Yeah, I mean, there will absolutely be circumstances where um, face coverings will be required and indeed additional PPE will be required. They, they will be determined by risk assessments carried out at a, a school level. I mean, where uh, a member of staff is required to provide personal care for a young person, absolutely uh, PPE will, will be required. But I think there's, there's also the issue, I suppose, building confidence in the system on the re return to schools. There is a lot of anxiety out in the school communities. There's a lot of anxiety in the, the wider community about uh, the return to school. And obviously, in terms of the education recovery group, uh, a number of stakeholders were involved in developing the guidance. And while the scientific advice may not suggest that face coverings would be required, other than the type of circumstances that I've uh, alluded to, there is a, a degree of sort of trying to to, to address that anxiety and, and in a sense, take um, members of staff, uh, indeed pupils, and their, their parents with us in, in, in this journey. I mean, it's, it's, it's a huge challenge in returning uh, to, to full-time education after five months of, of no education, essentially. Uh, and uh, I think it is important that the guidance reflects the sort of the levels of anxiety and, and tries to strike the right balance in, in, in terms of addressing those anxieties. Thank you. Um, can I bring in Mr. Green, please, Jamie Green? Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, good afternoon. Can I just uh, follow on from the last line of questioning and ask the Cabinet Secretary for Education to confirm, uh, is he saying that uh, it is desirable to have social distancing in secondary schools, but not essential or mandatory? Because the answer from Councillor McCabe seems, seems to suggest that it may be unrealistic to expect it to happen in many schools. Mr Swinney? The, the, uh, the, the advice that we received from uh, the Education Advisory Group was that uh, there was no necessity for physical distancing within secondary schools. But applying the precautionary principle that um, Councillor McCabe has talked about, we came to the view that where it was possible and practical to take measures around physical distancing, then those opportunities should be taken. Hence my example um, of a situation where we may have um, a number of classes in the same subject, they may be of different sizes, and therefore uh, there may be opportunities to vary the sizes of individual classes to try to reduce the number of pupils that might be in any one classroom. So the, um, the, the guidance sets out that physical distancing measures um, should be taken if they can be taken, but not at the expense of undermining the ability uh, of a full-time return to schooling for all pupils. Mr Green? Thank you for clarifying that. Can I, can I ask uh, Councillor McCabe, who is working closely with local authorities, um, uh, given that uh, last week uh, the, there were some media reports where you had said that it wasn't a done deal that all schools will return full time from August the 11th, do you now think it is a done deal, and how ready are councils to reopen fully to all pupils in just a few short weeks? Well, in, in, sorry, in terms of the process of developing the guidance. I think we've been doing this quite intensively for the past month, and obviously had previously been uh, producing the guidance for, for, for blended learning. Um, the schools and, and local authorities have been engaged in that process. So, within the education recovery group, uh, directors of education and uh, the chief executives have been represented, and obviously they they have been consulting the, their members uh, and informing the development of the guidance. So, I think. Uh, local authorities and sort of the edu education staff have got a fair idea of what the guidance is that's going to be published in, in uh, Thursday, and they've obviously been preparing on that basis. Uh, we have, um, I think, Education Scotland and, and uh, the Education Recovery Group have been uh, surveying how councils are prepared, and we've been getting feedback from our directors of education, and I think they, they are confident. 
that um, whatever decision that the, the government makes on Wednesday, Thursday, uh, they can implement that. If that means uh, full-time education, they can implement that by August. And if it means blended learning, they can implement blended learning. But the, the, the response in terms of the not a done deal is because we do not know sitting here today what decision the Cabinet is going to make on Wednesday. Uh, I do not know the decision. The, the Deputy First Minister has obviously alluded earlier on to the basis on which that decision will be made, but I simply do not know that decision. But on the basis of the feedback that I have received from directors of education, they are confident that they will be in a position to get schools back into full time learning during August. Mr. Green? In, in, the, in the interest of time, I will keep my supplementary very short. Uh, are you saying, uh, I mean, do you think there's physically uh, and logistically enough time uh, if the announcement is made on Thursday to revert to blended learning, which is a possibility? Do all schools have a, a contingency plan for blended learning? And is two weeks enough time to reconfigure schools and classrooms? Well, councils were obviously until the 23rd of June. And schools were obviously planning on the blended learning model, and a lot of progress had been made on that by the end of the term and indeed by the 23rd of June. And in a lot of cases, furniture had been moved, yes, and, and various other measures had been put in place, and investigations were going on into the transport contracts and and making arrangements for additional cleaning, etc. So the, the plans were reasonably well advanced. They weren't finalised in, in absolute detail, uh, and in a sense, they, they are there. Um, should they be required? Let's hope they're not required. Let's hope that the circumstances are that we are able uh, to return schools to full-time education, because that's clearly the best thing for the for the young people. Um, but the feedback I certainly get through directors of education is. Whatever decision the government makes on Wednesday and Thursday, then they will be in a position to implement that for uh, August. Can I bring in Donna uh, Mackay, please? Thank you, Convener. Um, it's to ask Councillor McCabe if he can say at this stage how many schools have committed to returning to 100%. We, we don't have that information at, a, at an individual school level, but what we can say is that all councils will commit to returning pupils 100% to the classroom at some point in, in, in August. There may well, obviously, as has been covered in, in the media, there may well be a period of phasing in, uh, and, and I think that's perfectly sensible. If children and young people have been out of school for five months. And they're they're not returning to the school environment that they were operating in prior to COVID nineteen. Some of them are not returning to the same school if they are going from primary into high school or are going from nursery into to primary. So I think it would be a perfectly sensible approach to take a phase in period to allow um, both pupils and indeed staff to get used to the new normal, which may well be a new normal with us for a considerable period of time. But the feedback I've got at a local authority level is that um, they are confident that all all pupils will be back in school full time. Those those who, in health terms, are able to obviously uh, be in school full time will be back in school full time uh, in August. Can I bring in Mr. Halcrow Johnson? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Convener. Can I just ask uh, uh, on that point to the Cabinet Secretary um, or to Councillor McCabe? How often is there, a, 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 I suppose, a picture of the state of readiness being built up um, by um, by COSLA, by um, the Scottish Government, in terms of um, information being fed from schools into into uh, local authorities, and then the local authorities updating the Scottish Government? Because you know, often we hear, well, we don't have that information, um, and I would have thought it, that would be something that was regularly being presented. Um, to uh, to Cosler and to government. Well, Councillor McCabe, do you want? Oh, sorry, Mr. Swinney, did you want to come in? Yeah, I'll, I'll on come that? in first on, on on this point. The, 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 there is a, a great deal of work undertaken by um, local authorities in their dialogue with individual schools and between Education Scotland and individual local authorities. So, for example. Um, 
uh, Education Scotland will report to um, the Education Recovery Group and to and to me and to Councillor McCabe um, about that level of preparation and uh, capability for schools to return full time. So uh, that enables um, Councillor McCabe to, uh, to 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 give the assurance to the committee that local authorities are providing um, that confidence level that schools can return uh, full time if the decision is taken that that should be the case. So th there is a flow of information that comes forward which enables um, us to be confident that all local authorities are engaging in this process and that by virtue they are also engaging with their schools to enable a restart of education to take place in August. Okay, Councillor McCabe? Yeah, maybe I could come at it from a slightly different angle, I suppose, as well as being the COSLA children and young person spokesperson, I'm the leader of a council and uh, I am engaging regularly um, with our director of education to get updates on where we are in progressing our plans to, to return to full-time education. The convener of, of the, the committee will be having regular dialogue. The opposition spokespersons will probably have regular dialogue as well. Uh, we have had regular meetings of our emergency committee throughout the, the, the pandemic period and have had regular updates on education and indeed the return to school. We've got a meeting of our committee tomorrow, which will get an update on where we are with the, the, the return to school. So it's not just, I have to say, the parliament and, and government that are, are, are indeed causal as a, a corporate national body. There are, I don't know, a thousand councillors throughout Scotland who are actively engaging in this process to try and ensure that their councils are ready. And obviously, in terms of our directors of education, they are, are, are part of the Association of Directors of Education. They meet regularly and have continued to meet regularly throughout this process. They have informed through the representative on the Education Recovery Group the, the guidance. So I can assure you there is a huge commitment within local authorities and across the education community to try to return our children to full-time education in, in, in August. And if the government makes that decision on Wednesday, we will be ready for it. Uh, th thanks for that, Councillor McCabe. And, you know, I appreciate there's a huge amount of both work and also information coming through. It's almost just where that standardised approach is, because obviously when we're looking at issues like this as a committee, we, you know, we want to be able to look at a state state of play. And I wonder whether the information has been coming through in that standardised approach. Can I just ask, in terms of the social distancing side, though, very very briefly, uh, probably to the cabinet secretary, what uh, ongoing monitoring of the impact of social distancing will be happening within schools, uh, and also uh, what ongoing um, review of the science of social distancing and the impact of social distancing, particularly in a school environment, will continue, obviously, once schools reopen. Can we have a brief Mr Swinney, sorry, yeah. Can we have a very regular um, monitoring of um, all aspects of the return to uh, to, to full-time schooling. The Education Recovery Group, in finalising the guidance on Friday, um, recognised that we would continue to meet on an ongoing basis to review the information on um, all aspects of the, the return of full-time schooling and the issues that arise from that. Obviously, we will be paying very, very close attention, as I have I think I highlighted in my answer to Beatrice Wishart earlier on to examples of any cases that emerge of COVID in whatever setting, and there will obviously be a particular focus on educational settings once the schools resume, uh, ever more so than there is um, on other uh, sectors just now. Um, we will also um, continue to receive information from the, um, the education subgroup which provides us with scientific advice. Because as the group itself acknowledges in its publications, this is an emerging uh, volume of scientific information. We are, you know, we are at a relatively early stage in the understanding of COVID. So therefore, th there will be examples and studies and research that will come out that will inform our thinking. And as I indicated to Mr. Greer in the earlier answer, 
we have to be prepared to revisit some of our assumptions if other information comes out that challenges those assumptions. So we are, the, 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 the advisory group has said that their advice is given at a particular moment in time, but we all accept that that advice may change because there may well be a change in the understanding of COVID, and we have to be open to addressing that if we want to create a safe environment in our schools. Thank you. Captain McCabe, do you wish to comment? I want to say that, I mean, we are at the start of a journey. That's the, the reality of it, and, and we don't know how things are, are, are going to pan out going, going forward. And it is important that there is continued uh, scrutiny at a national level, and the Education Recovery Group will, will continue to meet, and uh, all stakeholders and that will obviously be involved in that process. But as I keep reiterating, I don't know why I should, but I keep reiterating that the, the delivery of education on the ground, the provision of education, is the responsibility of democratically elected councils, and all democratically elected councils and, and elected members within councils will, will obviously be keeping a close eye and close scrutiny on, on the development and the return to schools. And if there are any issues, I would be expecting elected members to be raising those issues as well. I would be expecting elected members to be seeking appropriate information to monitor uh, how safe it is in terms of our schools returning. And that's why it's important, for example, that we get information uh, disseminated down to a local authority level uh, in terms of, for example, the number of positive cases. So uh, it is important because local authorities, uh, as the sort of can uh, the, the contingency planning authorities or resilience management will be will be closely involved in managing any incidents. And the the, the stark reality is, we know there are going to be incidents of of COVID nineteen in our schools, and we're going to have to to manage them effectively. Can I invite Mr. Johnson to ask his questions? Thank you, uh, convener. And, and following on from uh, Jamie Halcrow Johnson. Uh, you know, it's it's clear there's a significant amount of information uh, being shared between uh, councils and to the ERG, and monitoring that is going to be important. Um, so, can I ask? I mean, one of the the critical factors in terms of successful implementation of the guidance that will come forward will be the nature of the school estates, both the the fabric and design of school buildings, but also school capacity. So, can I ask Councillor McCabe? I mean, that must be one of the key bits of information that he, on an individual basis, is discussing with his director of education. It, you know, what can he uh, shed light on, on on what information is being uh, gathered by other uh, members of COSLA? And can I ask uh, the cabinet secretary whether that is information which is uh, being co uh, collected and consolidated centrally? Okay, can some McCabe? Well, I mean, the, the information on the capacity of the school estate across councils is available nationally, as I understand it, and, and absolutely it's available at a local level. And both the plans for blended learning and the plans for full time return will take account of the capacity in schools. And that was obviously one of the key constraints in, in the, the, the blended learning model in, in, a, in every authority, but a greater constraint in some authorities than others. That meant that the level of, of full of learn, level of face-to-face -face learning being offered in the blended learning models did vary across the country. The plan, the plan, and the guidance in terms of full-time return is to have every child back in school. But as we know, there are schools that are running at 100% capacity. There are schools that are running at over 100% capacity, and there are schools that are running at 40% capacity, so it does vary from school to school and from authority to authority, and individual plans will take account of that. So there will be there is going to be national guidance, but there obviously will have to be local decision making within that because councils and schools face different constraints. Mr. Swinney? Uh, on the issue of school estate statistics, um, th these are gathered on an annual basis, and um, I am pretty certain they are published to the extent that uh, certainly the overall school estate statistics are published. And I'm pretty certain, although I, I, I better write to Mr. Johnson just with absolute clarity, that the individual capacity and percentage occupancy 
of all schools is also published. So you know that is information. You know, I was looking at an Excel spreadsheet the other week there on the capacity of individual schools, the length and breadth of the country. So it is gathered, it is available. I am pretty certain it's published, but I will write to Mr. Johnson to confirm that point uh, uh, nicely. The, the cabinet secretary doesn't need to uh, write to me about that point. I, I know that it's that capacity statistics are statistics that publish. My, my point was really that that certain schools will find it difficult, for example, to implement one-way systems because of their design. Individual councils must be recording those sorts of issues on a on a risk register, and really it was a question of whether or not those sorts of items, those risk register items, were being collated. But I, 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 I'm happy to, to 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 move on unless there's there's particular insight on that point. If I could just, if I could reassure Mr. Johnson with the point that one of the implicit elements of the guidance is the uh, necessity for risk assessments to be undertaken on a school by school basis, and as he fairly makes the point, the school estate varies in its character, so there will be a necessity for that to be undertaken on an individual institution level uh, to make sure that the guidance can be implemented satisfactorily and that any issues that arise can be addressed. Now, as part of our regular monitoring about the implications of school opening, we will be wishing to identify through our dialogue with local authorities and schools what are the issues that are emerging and if there is any change to guidance that is required as a consequence. Thank you. Mr Johnson. I'd just like to ask a, a, a brief question on PPE before uh, moving on to the next questioner. So the point around PPE for, for teachers and pupils has been covered. I'd just like to ask for clarification about uh, the guidance that will be available for uh, support staff, as it's very often support staff who will come into the closest contact because they are support workers with uh, children with particular uh, needs or, or just simply the nature of their work. So can I ask uh, whether there will be specific guidance for support staff regarding PPE? Councillor McCabe, do you want to come in on that? Yeah. yeah, I mean, when I was talking earlier on, I wasn't talking about teachers, I was talking about staff in schools. And I'm afraid often people differentiate between teachers and other staff in school. As far as I'm concerned, all staff in our schools are, are equally valuable and make an equally valuable contribution. And, and indeed, the example I gave earlier on, somebody giving personal care, it's, it's not necessarily teachers that will be given per personal care, it's support staff who will be given personal care. And, and absolutely, PPE will be, re will be provided to every member of staff who requires it based on risk assessments. And I suppose back to the previous point about risk assessments, councils and, uh, and, and schools have already undertaken many risk assessments in the preparation for blended learning, working with our trade union colleagues to, to, to agree those risk assessments. Now, a lot of risk, these risk assessments will need to be revisited on the basis of full-time return to school, and that will be part of the, the process that will be getting underway in the next few weeks. But uh, schools and, and, and education authorities are well used to, to carrying out risk assessments. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to move on to uh, Mr Neil. Uh, this oh. is about testing. Uh, can I can I just ask uh, both the, the cabinet secretary and Mr. McCabe what the plans are in terms of the testing regime? In particular, how often will staff be tested on a regular basis? How often will students be tested on a regular basis? Are the arrangements the same for primary school as they are for secondary school? And do we have the necessary resources in place? in terms of the testing and tracing system to make sure that it is done satisfactorily. Mr Swinney? Um, Convener, the, the first point I would, I would make is the importance of seeing this issue in the context of the wider test and protect arrangements that we have in place within Scotland. So, where there is an individual who is symptomatic, um, they should seek a test in accordance with the guidance that is already outlined, and that is no different in a, a school setting to any other setting within our society. So that is a, a, you know, a fundamental element of the approach that we take. But we want to enhance the surveillance testing that is available within schools, and 
Public Health Scotland has been uh, working with the Education Recovery Group on developing an approach which will see um, sample testing being undertaken across really a very wide cross section of schools within Scotland to, um, to ensure that we are properly and fully monitoring um, any changes in patterns that um, may emerge as a consequence of the reopening of schools. So that will be uh, an additional layer of surveillance testing that will be available within our schools uh, to enable us to have reassurance that there is an effective approach being undertaken uh, to identify any changing patterns of COVID and to enable us to be able to take action accordingly uh, should that arise. Now, obviously, if there are positive cases identified within schools, then there will have to be the wider contact tracing work that is undertaken and then, of course, follow-up action as a consequence. And schools will, um, uh, will be required uh, to be in touch with public health authorities should such circumstances arise. Councillor McCabe, do you wish to add anything? I, th I think the DFM's covered, covered most of it, other than to say that obviously the detail behind that will be in the, the guidance, and the Education Recovery Group has had the, the benefit of direct discussion with Public Health Scotland around these type of issues, and we are satisfied collectively that the, the, the proposals that are in the guidance should provide reassurance to the school communities and the wider community that uh, where, um, where there are cases, we will respond to that. and. The testing surveillance that will be put in place should hopefully be fairly rigorous. Mr. Neil, can I, thank you, convener. This question may be a bit premature, but nevertheless, I'll ask it in any case uh, because obviously there's a lot of talk about the vaccine becoming available within the period ahead, and particularly the next six months or so. Let's hope that happens. But has there been any discussion so far? on the prioritisation of the people who are going to get vaccine in the education sector. For example, will education staff be higher in the priority list? Will students, particularly older students, be on the priority list? Has any thought been given to that? And similarly, and I know we've been waiting months and we've had lots of promises, but so far, to the best of my knowledge, we still don't have an antibody test that's 100 per cent reliable. But if we can, if we get one, clearly that could change things, and it could change things in terms of the testing regime in education as well. So, is there is there anything at this stage that you can tell us that we don't know already, either about antibody testing as it applies to the school sector, or about the prioritisation for vaccination? Cabinet Secretary, would you like to take that one? Yeah, I, 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 I don't have any further information on antibody testing um, that Mr. Neil seeks, and obviously there is a lot of optimism about a vaccine. Indeed, the First Minister and I um, were briefed on Friday um, about men, uh, Thursday, uh, excuse me, on the developments that are being undertaken in the production of a vaccine. And we explored many of the issues that Mr. Neil has raised about the questions of prioritisation that need to be undertaken should we be in a position of having a reliable vaccine. So the issue, these issues are being actively discussed uh, within the government, uh, taking the, um, the advice that we can from those who were talking directly to developers of the vaccine last week. And um, we, we were looking at the range of different possibilities that may emerge, and flowing from that, identifying key groups that would have to have priority in the process. Now, we are obviously, as Mr Neil indicates, at a very, very early stage in this process, um, but obviously sustaining our education system will be a key priority. None of us want to be in a position whereby there is any more disruption to learning than has been the inevitable disruption that has taken place since March. Um, so the points that are raised by Mr Neil are valid issues for us to consider as part of the prioritisation approach that we take forward. Okay, can I move quickly uh, to Mr Greer, who wants to come in on this area? 
Thanks, Kavino. Yes, just one question on on testing. It's the um, enhanced surveillance testing is not regular testing, so it won't be on offer to every teacher and, and older pupil. One teacher put it quite succinctly to me last week by saying, if football players can get regular testing, why can't we, given the number of people we're in close contact with for prolonged periods of, of time? But I accept there'll be more detail on that later this week. So my one question is, whatever the testing arrangements are, will they be fully operational on the 11th of August? Mr Swinney? The, the, the test and protect arrangements obviously will be fully operational on the 11th of August. In relation to the surveillance testing, um, we are working um, at speed to put those arrangements in place. Uh, I can't be definitive that they will be available on the 11th of August, but Public Health Scotland are working very actively uh, to, in, uh, to try to ensure that that is the case. Thank you. Can I move to questions from Dr Allen? Thank you, Convener. Uh, question for Councillor McCabe. Um, you mentioned there um, that we were at the start of a journey when it comes to the schools coming back, and I understand and accept the point you're making about the longer term. In terms of the first step of that journey, in the minds of parents, a high degree of commitment has been made to taking that first step through the uh, Education Recovery Group and, and elsewhere. Um, so can I, can I ask um, Councillor McCabe, uh, are we talking about a situation where the only thing that would change that would be the scientific advice changing, um, or are you suggesting that there are any other reasons why that first and important step wouldn't be taken on the 11th of August? Councillor McCabe. Well, the, the, de the decision to, re to turn to school, whether it be on the, the full, a full-time basis or it be on a blended learning basis, will be taken by the government. And the government has the power of direction of, of local authorities to, to, to reopen schools and, and whatever basis. So the school, schools will reopen in, in, in August, uh, and the basis will be determined by the government's decision on Wednesday and Thursday. But my point is that, that there is no reason why Cosla sees that that shouldn't happen. I, 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 don't, I don't see any reason why, why it shouldn't happen. No, the government, but the government will make that decision. It won't be down to COSLA, which isn't a public body anyway, uh, and it won't be down to local authorities because the power now rests with the government under the Coronavirus Act to, to make the decisions. The government will, will issue directions. Thank you. The, the other thing I want to ask about. Sorry, can you know, there's a bit there's a bit of feedback, but we could try it again. Okay, thank you, Convener. Uh, in that case, uh, my other question was uh, regarding uh, uh, children uh, from vulnerable groups and vulnerable backgrounds, uh, and just um, to ask uh, particularly about uh, uh, perhaps Cabinet Secretary's uh, view on how best uh, everyone should now ensure. Um, that the needs of that group are, in, are uh, taken care of when uh, schools will go back. I am thinking particularly of the, the cohort of, of those children and young people um, who did not take part in the, the hubs that were provided uh, over the lockdown period, uh, and um, just any observations about how we can best ensure that uh, specific needs of that group are met. Uh, Council, we came to you on to go first on that. Yeah. Happy to go, go first. I mean, I think we've we've said in the, the response to the, the committee's letter and in data. I think I said the last time I was be, before the committee, while a lot a lot of vulnerable children not didn't attend hubs, there was still a lot of contact with vulnerable children, whether that be through social worker or through third sector partners. So the, the, there is there is a an understanding of the. The needs of these young people, and absolutely, in terms of preparing for the return to school, there, there will be a need to focus on the needs of these young people, and that will that will be based on a an individual child basis. And and obviously, schools will take the the appropriate steps to ensure that these young people get this the support they need to to readjust to being back in school, but obviously to potentially catch up in any, any learning that they may have missed. Mrs. Sorry, Mrs. Winnie. Kavira, I think there's been 
a, a very large amount of good work undertaken by schools in supporting young people um, through the local authority organised hubs over the period since lockdown, uh, and then also in the outreach work that many school teachers have been involved in and um, uh, staff within schools have been involved in, in maintaining the contact that Councillor McCabe raised there with individual pupils. So I, I think that there, there's been a very determined effort for schools to operate out with their boundaries to reach young people and to support them, particularly where there's been vulnerability. And then, of course, that also brings in some of the wider uh, scope of local authorities in providing essential support to families with vulnerabilities. So the school has not been somehow in isolation from general work that's been undertaken by the local authority. The local authority has been uh, using some of the school channels to um, essentially support vulnerable families. I think all of us recognise that when the schools return, there is likely to be a greater degree of vulnerability prevalent within our schools as a consequence of lockdown, and that will require the focus and the attention of staff. We have indeed, in our guidance to the education system, made clear that there is a a necessity to address those issues um, in advance uh, as part of the uh, the preparation for learning that is undertaken um, to support young people. So focusing on the needs of individual children um, will, I think, be the absolutely crucial way in which these issues are addressed by individual schools. And of course, that is what schools excel at doing and join together all the different resources that can make an impact on the lives of individual young people. Dr Allen, did you wish um, to come back in? No, thank you, Camilla. Thank you. Uh, I'll move to questions from Mr Gray. Thanks very much, uh, Convener. Um, so this follows on from um, Dr Allen's question. Um, notwithstanding the, the, the work which has gone in over lockdown, uh, both in the hubs and homeschooling. I think everyone agrees that um, pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds will have suffered most uh, from the closure of schools and the, the attainment gap, uh, which the government has always made clear as its priority closing that gap, uh, will have widened. Now, in England, we have seen um, a national plan to provide tutoring for those pupils. Now, I am not in a position to to comment on the, the, the quality of that plan. Uh, but my question really is, um, if everyone agrees that that attainment gap will have widened, why do we have no national plan for new and additional support to try and make up that increase or try and get rid of that increase in the attainment gap when our schools go back? Kavira, the approach that... The, the approach that we, we are taking um, is essentially um, a, a coherent approach between national government, local government and schools to work collectively to close the poverty-related attainment gap. Now, one of the, uh, the, the key features, I think, of our education system in the period running up to COVID was an intense focus right across the education system on the tackling of the of the poverty related attainment gap and as we know from the data that is available on the distribution of pupil equity funding um, poverty is distributed very widely around our country given the fact that 95% of schools are in receipt of pupil equity funding which is a response to the measurement of poverty within our society so the, the approach that we take is that the support that is um, best put in place is support put in place at local level in a school by school basis to support the needs of individual children and young people. Now, to that end, um, the government is supporting that process by the recognition of the, the need to recruit um, more staff to support that process. So we've put in place resources to recruit more staff. Um, teaching staff and other staff to support the delivery of that educational activity to provide the opportunity for the school system to be able to make the impact on learning loss which we 
fear will be the case as a consequence of lockdown. And to reinforce that by or that, that can reinforce the investment that's already been made through pupil equity funding and the Scottish Attainment Challenge, which puts in place a very focused amount of activity and effort to ensure that the needs of young people who have experienced disadvantage can be properly and fully addressed through the power of education. So, Councillor McCabe, do you wish to add anything? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the, the, the primary focus at this point in time is to try and get our young people back into school. Um, but once they are back into school, obviously, assessments will need to be carried out of where each individual child is and a plan uh, to support that child in terms of whether it's catching up or, or, or whatever will need to be put in place. That will obviously require resources. There are resources in the system in terms of the the, the attainment challenge, as the Deputy First Minister has said, and that that those resources will be needed more more than ever uh, to to try and address those concerns. Thank you, Mr. So, Green. The, the two things really that I, I don't understand about um, that response is that the attainment challenge funding was already there. It's a significant investment. It's aimed at closing the attainment gap. But my question was what more uh, we're planning to do and resourcing uh, to try and uh, redress uh, the damage that has been done by COVID. The Attainment Challenge funding was already in place. Uh, and on top of that, Mr Swinney has said on a number of occasions that um, he has increased the flexibility in the use of that funding. But that funding was there to close the attainment gap. So that rather implies that that funding can now be used by local authorities more widely as they need it. So perhaps that's a, a reduction in resource um, directed at closing the attainment gap. And as for the additional teachers, which were announced in Mr. Swinney's um, statement last week, that amounts to uh, about, about a third of a teacher per school. So I, I really come back to my initial question. What new and additional resource and plan is in place to try and redress the damage that has been done for those pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds? There must be something new and different. Well, I can, Kavira, I've just, I've just explained, and Mr. Gray has reinforced that point that we have had, we've put in place additional staffing resources to, um, or made available resources to local authorities. To recruit additional staff to support in that effort, and we've also put in place resources to bridge some of the issues around the digital exclusion that young people from disadvantaged backgrounds experience, um, with resources available to local authorities to support them in that effort to uh, bridge the digital divide. So, um, those are the measures that we've taken already uh, to support the delivery of enhanced measures uh, to close the attainment gap and to recognise the fact that we will have to ensure as a system we focus on that priority uh, as we address the learning loss that has been experienced as a consequence of lockdown. Thank you. Um, can I move to questions from Ms Mackay, please? Thank you, convener. Um, my question is for Councillor McCabe. There are 6,500 autistic children in Scotland. The National Autistic Society of Scotland is concerned that the transition for autistic children going back to school will be extremely challenging, and they are urging a personal transition plan for all autistic children. This would include visits prior to school starting, designated safe spaces within the school, and a co principal contact for pupils and parents, among other things. Um, and this is all designed to alleviate stress on the children. Do you agree that a personal transition plan for these children should be put in place by local authorities? Well, as the, as the parent of an autistic child who will be going back to school in August, yeah, I, I, I fully agree with that. And I'm sure that the directors of education are listening very carefully to, to that advice from the National Autistic Society, because I've certainly shared shared it with my own director of education, and, and autistic children will be some of the children who need the greatest level of support in returning. I mean, I know from my own child, he's very, very anxious about actually returning to school in the first place. Um, he's, he's, he's not been doing any learning whatsoever since he's 
he's he's been off school uh, and um, he's quite feeling quite safe being in the house, to be perfectly honest. And the thought of going back to school uh, is, is is making him anxious. I'm sure he's he's not alone. But as we know, autistic children need routine. They need to be in school. They need to be supported. So, absolutely, I think it's fundamentally crucial that for all children with additional support needs, not just those in the autistic spectrum, that there there is individual plans in in place. Miss Mackay, thank you. And I mean, are you aware that this is happening among schools just now? Because we're talking about you know two weeks to go. So, do you know that these plans are being put in place at all, and by how many authorities? I don't have that level of level of detail. It's not something that we we discussed at a, a national level. Um, but certainly, my expectation as a counsellor, my expectation as a parent, is that the, the, that advice would certainly be given serious consideration. And I have no doubt there will be plans being being developed. Now we we are in a difficult situation, obviously, that we are in the middle of the summer holidays, and um, so and there is not a lot of time once the staff go back to school. To prepare for for the actual date of return, so I, I wouldn't necessarily think that plans will absolutely be in place for the day of return, but they certainly need to be in place not very long afterwards. Yes, Mackay, Thank did you. you have a final, just finally, yeah, just fi final question. Can I just ask about the plans or or the the way forward for pupils with additional support needs of any kind, and will an assessment be done of those needs by each local authority? Um, to take forward um, a, a comprehensive plan, you know, even you know, after COVID is, is no longer with us, um, that assessment authority. So I, I think we got all the questions. We just a little bit at the end there, but I'll go to Councillor McCabe first. Thanks. No, I, mean, I think the answer is very similar to, to, to the previous question. I mean, we, we are supposed to be focusing on. And the child is getting it right for every child, so therefore there needs to be a, an individual plan for every child. But particular with children with additional support needs, there, there, there absolutely needs to be plans in place. And I certainly would be expecting that as as, as a local councillor. Okay. Mr. Spinney, did you want to speak comment? Uh, just briefly, you know, the uh, the guidance that will be issued um, includes advice in relation to supporting schools and making the judgments about. Um, Ensure that young people with additional support needs are properly uh, supported in their return to schooling. I think we have to recognise that uh, the, the, you know, the very clear and real issues that Councillor McCabe raises about some of the anxiety that some young people will face, and our education system, I know, will be sensitive about how young people are approached and uh, brought back into the education system after such a period of, uh, of absence. And that will be one of the key foundations of the, the guidance that's, that's issued to schools. Ms Wishart, did you want to come in on this topic? I did, but I think the questions and the, uh, I think most of it has been answered, but I would just observe that um, when uh, it's rather a comment that there's already a 10% uh, drop in the number of specialist support staff. Um, so I am really concerned to ensure that there are enough dedicated staff uh, support for um, young people with additional support needs. Thank you. I'm going to move to Mr. Halko Johnson. Thanks very much. Um, if I can return to a subject that I've raised a number of times um, with the Cabinet Secretary, and that's digital poverty, uh, and also the laptops that um, have been ordered by the government. Um, I just wanted to uh, one. Um, are those laptops limited to one per household? Because obviously there will be a number of households with a number of children, and um, they will all need uh, access, or they may all currently being without being without access. Can I also ask what considerations have been made to households where um, there is no broadband or 4G um, coverage, particularly some of the more remote, um, uh, remote and rural communities? And lastly, um, you have assured me that you're working with local authorities to make sure that those laptops are available by the time the schools go back. But can I ask what consideration has been given for the uh, need for young people to obviously uh, get to uh, get training on those laptops or get to know how to use them, and also to ensure that um, they work with the systems that the school in that local authority area use as well, so that they are actually suitable to use. Mr. Swinney? Mr. Swinney? Uh, 
this this is certainly an issue I recognise that Mr. Halco Johnson takes a close interest in, and I'm happy to uh, give him some further information on the question of the distribution of the laptops, uh, which is the first um, part of the programme. Um, we are working closely with local authorities to determine um, how those should be distributed and to whom. And uh, fundamentally, uh, local authorities and schools are much closer to individual young people and their circumstances and are best placed to make a judgment about who would benefit from those um, uh, from those devices. So that, I think, addresses the point that if there is more than one required in one household, then if, if that is judged to be uh, an appropriate uh, distribution, then it should be so done. In relation to the point about uh, households who do not have any broadband connectivity, um, there is a, a facility within the contract that we have uh, arranged for devices to be produced, which can be used then with household broadband. And if there is no household broadband, for there to be some other connectivity that is available. I suspect Mr Halko Johnson's question on um, remote areas is perhaps encouraging me to go into the question of satellite broadband contacts, contracts, which I think is a very separate issue to the programme that we are undertaking. But you know, I'm happy to hear any representations from him about that point. Um, and then, lastly, in relation to the availability of the devices, I would simply gently make the point that we are in the school holidays, and the schools will be returning if the scientific advice is with us um, in, uh, in, in the 11th of August. Uh, at that moment, we will start to distribute the uh, devices to pupils, and that will be done at the earliest possible practical opportunity. Can I come back very quickly, convener, yes. on that? Yes, quickly, yeah. Thank you very much. So, so you, what you've said before was that um, previously, I understand, is that they would be with the young people, the pupils that needed them by the time schools goes back. What you're saying now is that the rollout will happen as the young people come in. Now, obviously, I appreciate that um, part of that will be accessing them from schools, but that suggests that, that the, there has to be then a period where the young people are picking up the laptops, getting used to them, seeing if there are any problems. So that could delay them actually using them for for days or longer if there's any problems. I, I think I think I think with the greatest respect, Mr. Halko Johnson, we're we're we we're, we're, we're getting down to issues that are perhaps a, a, a matter of a day. And uh, I really think we should leave it to schools and uh, to decide exactly um, how these devices can best be rolled out and what impact they can have on individual young people. Uh, we've purchased the Chromebooks. We're making them available at the earliest possible opportunity that we have available, and we will continue uh, to work with local authorities to address the digital divide that exists within our society. Thank you, Kevin. I bring in Mr. Gray again, please. Thanks, convener. Um, I, I had a question which was um, uh, uh, about workforce, and it's quite specific, and it's probably for Mr. McCabe. Um, so, uh, one of the things which will have to happen in schools is that we'll have to have a much more rigorous cleaning regime. Uh, and I've certainly heard of one local authority saying that they will need to recruit 165 additional school cleaners in order to make that cleaning regime possible. So my question to Mr. McCabe is, um, were the resources that the Cabinet Secretary announced last Thursday uh, for staff such as cleaners uh, adequate? Do local authorities have enough resources in order to recruit the school cleaners they need? And will they be able to do that uh, within the next fortnight, which is when they need them? Councillor McCabe. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think. This is a, a huge challenge. There's, there's no doubt about it. I mean, obviously, in terms of the, the blended learning model, councils were already um, looking to significantly increase their, their cleaning workforce uh, and uh, the, the specifications. The, the guidance that will will be issued on Thursday will take that to, to, to an even higher level and will require even more resources in, in, in terms of cleaning and. 
I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting example you, you give. I mean, I saw an advert um, the other night on Twitter from Eastern Bartonshire Council who were looking to hire 72 extra day cleaners from working in schools between 9 and 3 o'clock, because some of the cleaning will obviously be done during the day while, while uh, children are in, in situ. They were also looking to, to hire a a, 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 a team to oversee the the, the, the standards of, of of cleaning as well. So cleaning on its own is going to be a huge additional cost. There will be other costs, obviously, potentially around school transport, PPE, the the, the type of logistical costs that um, will be required to be met to, to safely return children to, to school and to implement the guidance. And obviously, COSLA has made a public response to. The, the, the statement that the cabinet secretary made on Thursday in the, the announcement of the additional 20, 20 million. So I don't feel the need to reiterate what that response is. But we are in we are in continuing discussion with the government over additional resources, and there is no doubt that the guidance will come with a heavy price tag. We don't know what that price tag is at the moment, and we can't possibly know what the price tag is because um, we haven't yet went through the process of actually. Acquiring the extra cleaners and putting in place the extra school transport, buying in the, the extra PPE, etc. But we can, based on our estimated cost for uh, blended learning, based on professional judgment, we know it's going to be significantly more than twenty million pounds. So we, we're obviously in continuing dialogue with the government to try and secure additional resources. Mr. Swinney, and on the. the the, the question that Mr Gray raises, um, I obviously announced on uh, Thursday uh, £20 million of new resources to address some of the logistical issues that local authorities uh, are facing. But I also uh, announced with it a commitment to continue to engage with local government about the identification of the costs, because the costs, as Mr McCabe has just said, um, uh, are not yet known. And uh, what I was trying to indicate with my announcement on Thursday was uh, a commitment of good faith of the government to work with the local authorities by putting up front resources to that extent. Now, the, in terms of quantification, um, when we received uh, submissions from uh, local government around the costs associated with blended learning, uh, the estimated full year costs of cleaning and PPE uh, were judged to be £16 million for the whole year. So I felt that by producing £20 million before the school year has started and before we have taken the decision to open schools full time, recognising that we are going to have to have enhanced cleaning uh, regimes in place, was a reasonable indication of support to local authorities along with a commitment to work with councils to address um, any issues that arise out of the costings. And I reaffirm that commitment today. I'm going to move to Ms Ross. Please. Thank you, Convener. Um, good afternoon, um, Deputy First Minister, Councillor McCabe. I have had constituents get in touch with me about their children's mental health, and some of them are becoming increasingly worried. and. Uh, some are keen for the schools to go back full time. Some are very nervous about what this means. So, how will these parents access help and support should they wish to? How are teachers and all the staff in the school going to deal with these challenges? And will the Scottish government consider the introduction of mental health first aid training for teachers and staff should they wish to? Access it, Mr. Swinney. Kavina, in the uh, curriculum guidance that we've issued um, to to deal with the recovery from COVID, we've attached a significant priority to addressing the well-being of children and young people. And I think the points that Gail Ross raises are very, very significant. Uh, young people will have had a significant period away from formal schooling. There will be anxieties about coming back into schooling. Some of those young people may have had uh, very difficult experiences during the period of lockdown, and some of them may have suffered 
bereavement and loss as well to a greater extent. So, in our curriculum guidance, we've made it clear to the education system, and that's to all staff, that we need to think through at a school by school level how do we support most effectively the well being of children and young people. And I think that fundamentally relates to their mental well being. I saw some interesting reports this morning of the steps that, for example, example Portobello High School in Edinburgh intends to take forward to essentially create a much more reassuring, um, welcoming and supportive environment into a large secondary school to make sure that this issue can be properly addressed. And I would certainly encourage schools. I know that schools will be thinking these issues through because of the anxieties they will have. On the question of, obviously, we are well advanced in a programme of delivery of mental health counsellors into the school system, and I answered questions on that last week. Um, and uh, obviously, there are arguments about and proposals around mental health um, first aid. And I certainly acknowledge the very keen interest of members of staff to wish to be able to properly support. Uh, pupils and to support them in all that they do in their learning and to enable them to be in a position to, uh, to, 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 to overcome any issues that they may face. And if that involves access to mental health first aid training that members of staff wish to do that, then I'm very happy to consider that. Ms. Rovas? Thank you. Um, Another thing that is worrying some parents is um, transitions. So it was mentioned earlier. Um, I think Councillor McCabe mentioned that some of the pupils going back would be going back to a completely different setting, and um, transitions can be difficult enough as it is without doing them in the current climate. So, what measures are being put in place for these P1, S1, and uh, pupils and students in further in higher education for their transitions? Councillor McCabe. Prior to, to the end of term, that was one of the issues was about trying to get schools open in June so that some of the transition arrangements could take place in June. And I know that happened in my authority, albeit in a in a limited sense, where previously, for example, a pupil moving from primary into secondary might go to a secondary school on a Wednesday afternoon or a, a whole day on a Wednesday for a number of weeks. It was a it was a one day visit to to see around and and and, and, and get used to the new environment. Uh, and part back to the, the point I made earlier on about um a phased return and the benefits of a phased return would be to allow some of that sort of transitioning to take place in perhaps the first week before a, a, a full return, so it's a it's a very important issue. But can, can I maybe just respond to some of the points in terms of uh, mental health issues? I, I think that's a huge issue, and and it's a, a, it absolutely is going to be a focus for education authorities and schools. As I said before, on on the twelfth of August or whenever, children are not going back to the same environment they left, and you can't be expecting them simply to pick up a normal curriculum from day one. There needs to be a focus on their health and well-being, and that will be a, a key part of what people call the recovery curriculum. Obviously, addressing issues around numeracy and literacy will, will be central as well. But actually, their health and well-being will be a primary focus in, in those early days. I think the, the, the suggestion of mental health first aid training is, is, is absolutely a, a good suggestion. But that is actually taking place at a number of authorities. Mental health first aid training is available within my authority. I, I know that. And I think the other thing is, in, in terms of counselling, um, you know, pre pre um, pandemic, we were going through a process uh, of of trying to ensure that um, children in schools had access to counselling services. Uh, and those processes are underway. Obviously, the the pandemic has has interrupt, uh, interrupted the process. But again. I know from our own authority we, we are in the middle of a procurement exercise, and I know the hope and expectation is that those services will be in place. I, I wouldn't guarantee for the start of the school term, but certainly they will be in place early in the school term, and that will give a, an additional resource. And obviously, young people do have access at the moment to, to whatever 
statutory services exist there, albeit the, the challenges that the, those services face because of the pandemic and the, the demands and the resources. So, absolutely, addressing the concerns around young people's mental health has got to be a huge priority. Thank you, Councillor McKay. We're in our last ten minutes, and I have uh, four four members still wanting to come in. So, if we could have really quick questions. Really succinct answers that would be really helpful, I and mean, we might get through them all, although I can't guarantee it. Um, can I bring in Mr. Green first of all? Thank you. Um, can I just go return to the issue of funding? I mean, I'll keep the question simple. Uh, Councillor McKay, I appreciate you said you can't put a number on how much more money you will need, but obviously, when the guidance is produced, hopefully later this week, uh, there will be an opportunity for you to uh, to review that guidance and come up with a number. How quickly do you think you'll be able to go back to government and say this is actually how much money we need versus how much you've announced? Well, well councils obviously will go through the process I, I, I alluded to earlier on in terms of putting in place the, the additional cleaning staff, um, putting in place the contracts for, for bus services, and although the young people. Uh, may well be going on the school bus and without any social distancing, there will be additional measures required in terms of dual contracts for, for safety. So there will be additional costs. Councils will will collect those costs, uh, and we will through through COSLA we will feed those costs back in an ongoing basis. Now the reality is we don't know how long these arrangements will take place, and before people get into trouble by saying this is going to be in place for a year. So we simply don't know. So it might be that we have to to, to look at this on a sort of term by term basis or, or a quarter by quarter basis. But we will collect the costs, we will feed those back to the government. So I would imagine that within a number of weeks of schools going back, we will be in a position to, to have a, a, a good approximation, good estimate of the likely costs for the whole year. Based on the the initial cost that we we may well be facing over the the first term, so I think relatively quickly we'll be able to go back to government with, with costs. But obviously, that does then require councils to fund those costs up front at a time when we are facing enormous financial pressures. Despite the significant additional funding we've received from the government, and despite the the, the degree of flexibility the government's provided, councils are still facing. And exceptional costs here. I mean, we're talking the COSLA's estimate is currently around about half a billion pounds. So we're talking about these costs for education being on top of that half a billion pounds. So that puts in context the, the challenges that we face. Thank, thank you for that. And um, obviously, listening to what you're saying, and I'm sure we'll respond accordingly. Um, can I ask the cabinet secretary a question that I've been asked by many parents, and that's a, a simple one: is what uh, what are the specific metrics or pieces of uh, scientific scientific evidence that you're waiting on to inform the decision uh, this week uh, that the cabinet will make? Is, is it uh, is it the number of positive cases of the virus? Is it uh, the rate per per ten thousand? Or it, you know what are the measurements that you're looking at when uh, making that decision? Uh, uh, that's the question that many parents have, have been asking me, and, and would like to pass that on to you. Mr. Swinney? Well, all of the um, points that Mr. Green mentioned are uh, measurements of the prevalence of COVID. And it's the prevalence of COVID in our community that is uppermost in the government's mind. And we have seen very sustained reductions in the prevalence of COVID, uh, which led to my announcement on the 23rd of June that it was possible to consider a planning assumption of a return to full-time schooling uh, in August. Uh, we have managed to maintain that downward pressure on COVID, although we have seen in over the last fortnight or so um, a few days in which we have seen uh, comparatively higher levels of the prevalence of COVID within the community in terms of positive cases. So these are uh, are points of data that are looked at very, very closely and intensely by government to make sure that the decisions that we are taking are based on safe and responsible assumptions about the prevalence of COVID, and that is a very significant decision for the government to take. Can I bring in quickly, Mr. Green? Oh, 
sorry. No, no, it was fine. It's, oh. It was just it's not a single metric, therefore it's a, a range of uh, of metrics that you're looking at. Uh, we look at we look at a variety of data about the prevalence of COVID within the community. Uh, there's a bulletin published on a weekly basis by the chief statistician, which sets out the level of infectiousness, the number of cases, and um, the uh, projections in relation to the um, the R number. Uh, and a variety of other factors, all of which play into the judgment the government has to make, which is a very difficult judgment about what is the prevalence of the, the, the virus and is it safe for us to take further steps to relax lockdown. Now, I would make the point that the government has taken significant steps to relax lockdown in other sectors over the course of the last few, uh, few weeks and months, and we must look very carefully at whether that has an effect on the prevalence of the virus within the community, uh, because we could see, as a consequence of other decisions, whether it's about opening up tourism, or about opening up hospitality, or opening up retail, that that could result in um, a, a, an increase in prevalence, which would then undermine our ability to reopen schools. But the reopening of schools uh, on the 11th of August is uh, of the highest priority for the government, and that is what will weigh heavily on the decisions that the Cabinet takes on Wednesday. Can I move quickly to Mr Neil? Yeah, a quick question to Mr McCabe. Right at the start, he gave a very clear commitment that local authorities are very committed to getting the schools back full-time in August, but he just said a couple of questions ago, or a couple of answers ago, that they don't yet have they don't have not yet recruited the additional cleaners, the additional transport, and the additional PPE. Now, given that we're now very close to the wire, and I think most people expect the cabinet to give the go-ahead on Wednesday to the schools reopening, I think a lot of people would be disappointed if they didn't. Are councils going to be in a position because cleaners, transport, and PPE will be needed from day one? So. Is, how does that reconcile with the commitment that the schools will open on the 11th of August? Well, I mean, while, you... yeah, while, while the schools have been in holiday, or the term time staff within the schools have been in holiday since the end of June, the education staff have not been the support staff and the, the authority, people who negotiate contracts for buses, people who um, hire staff, etc., have not been in holiday. So that, that work has been ongoing and has been underway. And obviously, as I said, plans were in were in place. But yeah, I mean there are certain areas where it may be challenging to, to hire staff. So it might be I mean there, there are potential problems in higher cleaning staff, for example. And it may well be that it, you might be asking additional staff to work extra hours until new staff are in place. So I, I don't I don't underestimate the logistical challenge there will be to, to get all the mitigations that are in the guidance in place for, for day one. All I'm saying to you is the feedback from our directors of education who are co coordinating the, the development and implementation of local plans is that they are confident that these measures will all be in place by the return date to, to, to education. Okay. Right. Can alluded to a, an ongoing role for the, the ERG uh, going forward, and indeed that, that the science may change. I was just wondering if the Cabinet Secretary could clarify what the role for the Educational Recovery Group will be going forward, and indeed whether that we should expect updated guidance and, up, and updated uh, 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 your scientific note um, uh, in the coming weeks and months. I intend that the Education Recovery Group will continue to meet on an ongoing basis uh, to review the experience of um, schools reopening. Uh, I think for a sustained period of time, it would be prudent to monitor all of that activity and to identify if there are any areas where we need to enhance the guidance that is available, or should there be any changes to scientific advice that is available to us. Um, I think there is a wide understanding that COVID is um, a changing and moving issue, and we have to be able to respond to those uh, those factors in the period going forward. So, 
uh, the Education Recovery Group will continue to meet, and we will uh, review any change, make any changes to guidance that are required. Um, because what's been our strength has been the drawing together of the various stakeholders um, that we that, that, that we need to draw together to enable a safe reopening of schools. And I have welcomed the dialogue and the engagement in that process that we've had to date. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I understand Councillor McCabe has to leave directly at half past five, and we thank him for his attendance. There is one final question for the Cabinet Secretary on uh, the equity audit, but Mr Swinney, are you able to stay for that? Would you prefer we did that in writing? Yes, I'm happy to do so, Kevin, yes. Okay, happy, so, happy um, thank, you, Ms. thank you, Councillor McCabe, and I'll bring in, finally, Rose Creer. Thank you, Convener, and, and thank you to Councillor McCabe. Cabinet Secretary, the last time you were with the committee, you let us know that an equity audit was going to be conducted. Now, at that point, it was in the context of blended learning being the, the expectation from August. It, so, can I ask what the, the status of the equity audit is now, and if it is going ahead, how that will interact with the risk assessments that all councils and schools are being uh, the, sorry, the equality impact assessments that all councils and schools are uh, expected to carry out. Mr. Swinney? Uh, essentially, um, I would view them to be separate processes. Um, the um, uh, equality impact assessments are essentially key firmaments of, uh, of public policy and scrutiny. And they have to be taken forward and taken forward in their own merits. I think the equity audit is of a slightly different character. It is about um, considering system wide what are the issues that have emerged as a consequence of COVID and what are the implications of those issues for the government's wider policy on education and the challenges that that policy is trying to address, particularly in relation to the nature of the poverty-related attainment gap. So, um, the, uh, the, the there are two different processes. I, I'm certain there will be material that is relevant between them, um, but they will be carried out in that way. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And can I thank uh, everyone for their attendance today, especially uh, Cabinet Secretary and Councillor McKay for the evidence. And the committee now moves into private session to review the evidence that we've heard today. Thank you.